All right, welcome everyone to the local, state and local strategies for reversing inequality. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about how we can change America to be a more equitable, equitable place for all. I'm Andisa Rossini, New Mexico Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. We are proud to be the nation's oldest progressive multi-issue think tank. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah Anderson. She will discuss the growing movement to use state and local taxes on corporations to narrow the gaps between CEO and worker pay and generate revenue for social programs. She directs IPS's Global Economy Project and is a co-editor of the IPS website, inequality.org. Teo Filo Reyes of Restaurant Opportunity Center, Rock United, will also be joining us. He is definitely a soldier. He wasn't feeling too well today, but he <laughs> has risen above it and he has come to be a part of this webinar. So we will make sure that we use his time really wisely and also respect the fact that, again, he has come today despite feeling well. So thank you, Teo, for joining us still. Um, he has been a part of really important campaigns to raise the subminimum wage to actually be a fair and living wage for restaurant service servers and other tip workers. Eight states have eliminated this two tier wage system and Rock is campaigning in several states and cities to expand the one fair wage. So as I know some people might be coming a little bit late and also people are wondering who's in this webinar. Um, we wanna make sure even though we're online that attendees and participants feel like they're more connected and everyone has a sense of where everyone is coming from today. So whether you are here as an individual with a passion for social justice or an individual with the same passion who also works in or represents an organization committed to social justice, we want to know where you are or where your organization is based. So Mimi, our tech guru, if you please raise <laughs> the poll. So you will see a poll coming up. We'll give you a few seconds to answer. And if you're international, you will see a choice for outside the US and also if you're a US territory and not on the mainland. All right, we're gonna give you a few more seconds to answer. Closing the poll in five seconds. All right, Mimi, let's close the poll. And let's see the results. Oh, look at that. Most people are from the Northeast. I'm not totally surprised. I am surprised to see that many people in the Southeast. So welcome Southeast. I'm from the Southwest. So I represent one person in that. We got the Midwest. Good to see you. West Coast. Good to see you as well. And hopefully our international people will be joining us later because we did see you on the RSVP list. All right. Thank you, Mimi. So now let's get into it. The Institute for Policy Studies again, is a progressive think tank. It was founded in 1963, and it connects research and education to action. We also run a website, again, inequality.org. It is a hub of facts, analysis, and commentary in our economic divide. Um, IPS colleague, Sarah Anderson, she runs that. And she'll introduce herself and say a little bit more. I wanted to talk about Teo real quickly and the Rock United campaign. It's seeking to improve wages and working conditions of the nation's restaurant workforce. It represents over 25,000 restaurant workers and over 200 high road employers and thousands of engaged consumers united for raising restaurant industry standards. Before we dive into the presentations, I'd like to say a little bit more about the thinking beyond this webinar. As you know, we're at a time of raging debates here in Washington about federal policies, about the budget, about the state of our nation, and also there's an upsurge in public interest and resistance at local and state levels, especially around policy. Both Tail and Sarah are very involved in both these national and local fights. Sarah is in the middle of the tax and Wall Street reforms. She's actually been in the middle of that for a while. So <laughs> thank you, Sarah, for all the hard work you put in. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sarah's been doing this before Trump, so she, she knows what it's about. Um, Teo and Rock have played a critical role in the successful campaign to block the nom nomination of fast food CEO Andra sorry, Andrew Puzder for Labor Secretary. I know you all remember that going on, so um, that's a great moment of recognition. Even though we have a lot of struggle, we also have been having a lot of gains, so that's definitely something to celebrate. Um, Puzder, as you all know, is CEO of Carl's Jr. and Hardee's and sort of part of this notorious force known as the other NRA. <laughs> so we'll get more into that. They've also been playing a key role over ongoing battles over federal worker protections. 
And it's clear to us that there are a lot of opportunities, despite the current climate, to win positive change in the near term outside of Washington, again, with the upsurge of citizens and people all over the U.S. being a lot more interested in local and state resistance and paying a lot more attention. So today we're going to focus on two ways that people are working to reverse inequality at the state and local levels. They are by no means the only ways, and perhaps we can organize future webinars to highlight some of the other innovative strategies that are taking off across the country. Our focus for today is first on taxing CEOs and eliminating the sub-minimum wage for restaurant workers and other tipped workers. The combination of strategy, strategies really reflects that IPS understands that not only do we have inequality at the top where we need to tackle both ends of the problem. We need to make sure that the people at the top, that we're getting these industries taxed, that we're eliminating that excess, but also that we need to be raising people up from the bottom, um, the people who are the most affected communities. We're talking about women, we're talking about people of color, we're talking about low-income people, and those are the people that make up the restaurant industry and are the ones most affected by these issues. So the combination of these strategies is taking on the top end and the bottom end. In other words, we'll only be able to end poverty and build a healthy democracy if we reduce the concentration of wealth and power at the top, but also we are giving um, fair wages, stability, security, and what is owed to the rest of American society and those that seem to be at the bottom of this pyramid that makes up um, inequity in America. So the format for today's event is pretty easy. We're going to have each speaker do a 10 to 15 minute presentation. After their individual presentation, each speaker will have a five minute block to answer your questions. We encourage you as we're going through the presentation to send any questions through the Q&A box. It'll be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So again, you can send those during. I'll be watching and writing them down. I'll be watching and writing them down as we go along. I will also give a minute or two after the presentation for you to write down your questions. After we do both individual presentations and the Q&As, we will open it up for questions for both speakers. We want to make sure that we're fostering an intersection of issues and collaboration. That will be for about 15 minutes. So, before we get into the presentations, we have one more poll. Um, we have a lot of good things going on in this room, and we have a lot of good things going on with all the people who joined us today. And we want to make sure that it is also amplified beyond what's happening in this next hour. So, for our next poll, Mimi. So, during today's webinar, if you are a social media guru or you just want to try it out for the first time or you see it as a way to further movement campaigns or even if you're like, I don't know, but you want to try it out, I really think that you should. If you're going to share your insights today using a hashtag during and after today's webinar, which one would you use? And check all that apply. I'll give you a few more seconds. I were closing the poll in five seconds and it's closed. That's okay, Mimi. So here are the results. So some people said 12% make America great again. I'm sure that you said that because um, you see it sort of as ironic, um, <laughs> as sort of doing an alternative to the right and to sort of this ridiculous rhetoric that really just furthers inequality saying, okay, if we're really gonna make America great again, let's do that. That's an interesting idea, but I really suggest that you use CEO pay. That is actually the hashtag um, around Sarah's work and her campaigning around reversing inequality for CEO and worker pay gap. And then of course, one fair wage, which I saw a lot of people did highlight. We have that at 80%. And that is a well-known hashtag that's used around the work that Rock is doing in other great organizations. We have Muslim ban for a few. Again, that's not directly related to this campaign, but I'm sure we have a lot of great thinkers and activists out there who can make that intersection. That's fine, but please, please use hashtag CEO pay and hashtag one fair wage so that people can see what's going on in this room and directly connect the issues in a succinct way. So thank you, Mimi. 
I'm now going to pass it over to my colleague, Sarah Anderson. She's going to introduce herself and go on to her presentation. Great. Well, thank you, Mandisa, and thank all of you for joining. I want to say uh, for myself it, uh, to be able to spend an hour talking about the exciting work that people are doing around the country at the city and state level is like a holiday for me. Uh, as Mandisa said, I also work on federal policies around taxes and Wall Street and so forth. And as you can imagine, it's not a whole lot of fun these days. Uh, but what is really keeping us going here in Washington, I think, is the upsurge in energy and, and activism around the country. And I really believe that in response to the horror show that we're seeing here in Washington, we are going to be seeing more bold and innovative reforms coming out of state and city governments than we could have ever imagined. And I get to talk about one of those today. And so uh, if we can get my PowerPoint up, um, I will explain it to you. Um, basically, um, we're just about ready to go, but the, the reform that I get to talk about today is what I call uh, the Portland precedent. So in December of 2016, the City Council in Portland, Oregon, passed uh, what will be the world's first tax penalty on corporations with extreme gaps between their CEO and their worker pay. And since then, we've seen a, a wave of momentum around this. Legislature leaders in at least five states have introduced similar legislation, and San Francisco is also working on it. Now, I know uh, what you're dying to do is uh, dive into the technical details of these tax reforms, because what could be more fun than, than getting into to tax uh, uh, technicalities? But instead, I'm going to take a bit of a step back here and talk first about why I think it's a good idea to tax big CEO to worker pay gaps. Um, when they had the vote uh, in Portland back in December, they have a five-member council there, and so they just needed three people people uh, to get this thing passed, and they only got three votes, uh, but it was fascinating to see that each one of those people voted for this tax for a different reason. Uh, the champion was a guy uh, for whom this was all about uh, combating inequality, and he loves to show charts and figures about the rise in income and wealth concentration. So for him, it was about fighting back against the 1%. Um, for another person on the council, it was uh, her motivation was because they had a hole in their budget for something she cared deeply about, which is a new homelessness initiative uh, there in Portland. So she thought saw this as a fair way to raise revenue to take care of some of their most vulnerable people. And then finally, uh, the mayor of Portland uh, came at this from a business angle. Uh, he uh, had a personal experience working at an employee-owned uh, uh, engineering company. And he felt from his own experience, he understood the value from a business perspective of having narrow gaps in pay. That at his firm, they had very narrow gaps and it encouraged the, the team spirit and the spirit of you know, shared uh, value that made his company uh, beat their competition, which had uh, bigger gaps. And I point out these three different reasons because it gets at the potential for broad coalition building around these issues. And I want to go into each one of them in just a little bit more detail. Um, first of all, on, on the inequality thing, I, you know as well as I do that median wages for workers have been stagnating while the share of income going to the 1% has been skyrocketing. And who are those 1%? Well, amazingly, two-thirds of the top 1% households are headed by a corporate executive. So CEO pay and, and the skyrocketing levels of that have been a key driver of inequality. And if we could get these taxes on companies with big CEO to worker pay gaps, uh, it would incentivize companies to narrow gaps, both by bringing down the top end, the CEO pay end, but also by lifting up the worker end. And it's also important to know that it hasn't always been this way. Um, uh, you can see from this chart that the ratio between average CEO pay at big companies and average worker pay has bounced around, but clearly the trend is up and up and up. 
Um, back in 1980, it was only about 42 to 1, uh, the, the ratio. T last year, in 2016, it was 347 to 1. And this hasn't happened just as a, a force of nature. I could say more about why this is later, but we are seeing really extreme levels of um, gaps between CEO and worker pay. Um, the second uh, benefit of these taxes, raising revenue. Um, like I said, in Portland, they had a hole in their budget. They needed about $3 million for a homeless uh, service program. So they designed their tax to raise about $3 million. But you can design it in different ways. And so the revenue will really vary depending on how you design it and how broad your base is. Um, I think there's some healthy competition among progressive cities on the West Coast there. San the San Francisco people have assured me they're going to raise way more money. Than, than those people in Portland. Um, as far as the business angle goes, well, I, I decided I would feature JP Morgan here because he looks like such a fun guy, doesn't he? I mean, wouldn't you want to be in a coalition with him? He looks like a, a barrel of monkeys. Um, and he did speak out um, forcefully that he felt this is the most powerful banker in history, um, that if you paid your top executives more than 20 times what you paid your worker, that it was not going to be good for business. And there's a lot of academic research to back this up, that when you have extreme pay gaps, it can um, undermine worker morale, which can reduce productivity and increase turnover. I thought this guy might be a little bit more appealing than J.P. Morgan. He's the guy the Harvard Business Review selected as their top performing CEO in the world last year. And when they interviewed him about why he was so successful, what he wanted to talk about was pay disparities and why it was so important to narrow those um, from a business perspective. A little bit more on why I think the time is right for this. Um, You've seen the proposals on the table here in Washington around the budget, around the tax reform, slashing taxes, slashing uh, public spending. Cities and states are going to need to find innovative new ways uh, to make up for federal uh, spending cutbacks. Um, another reason the time is right is that public outrage over CEO pay is high and it, it cuts across the political spectrum. I've known this for a long time. I'm from a red area of Minnesota, a rural area. For 20 years, I've been talking to people there about CEO pay, and I've yet to meet anyone who's not outraged about overpaid CEOs. But the polls are really um, bearing this out. I mentioned one here from Stanford, where nearly three quarters of Americans think that CEOs are overpaid re relative to their workers. And that's even when um, it, it uh, showed that Americans vastly underestimate how much CEOs actually make. So <laughs> when they find out how much they actually make, they're even more outraged about it. Um, okay, now the, the moment you've been waiting for. I can't see your faces here, but I'm sure they're just lighting up now as we get into the technical details of the tax. Um, the Portland law ap applies to a, a surtax on the local business uh, tax uh, to companies that have very wide gaps. Um, so they've got this existing business tax of 2.2% of local profits. Um, what the new law will do is put a 10% surtax on top of that uh, for companies that pay their CEO more than 100 times what they pay their worker. And then if you pay your CEO more than 250 times what you pay your worker, the surtax goes up to 25%. So just to get concrete, if a company owed the city of Portland $100,000 for its business tax, and has a pay ratio of 175 to 1, their surtax tax would be $10,000. Um, more details. So lots of people assume that this uh, tax would just apply to companies headquartered uh, in the state or city. And that, that's not, uh, not the approach here. The Portland government identified more than 500 corporations that do enough business in the, st in the city to be subject to this uh, surtax. And they include the heavy hitters. You've got Walmart, because they've got stores there. You've got Wells Fargo, because they have branches there, and so forth. So if you do have a business presence, you could be hit by this tax. Um, where, how are they going to figure out what the ratio is between the CEO and worker pay? Well, the SEC is supposed to be collecting that. Um, under the Dodd-Frank financial reform law, we have this new regulation. Um, the numbers are supposed to start coming out in early 2018. 
And that is a, a huge advantage because it's it, it makes it much less expensive to try to implement this tax at the state and local level because you have this federal source of data. Just briefly, I mentioned that five states that I know of, there might be more, um, have introduced legislation similar to what passed in Portland back in December. Um, they, they have some slight variations. Massachusetts, Minnesota, and Rhode Island, those are pretty similar to the Portland model. In Illinois, they've proposed a flat annual fee um, approach. And then in Connecticut, they have a bit of a carrot and stick approach where if you have a really small gap, then you have you get a discount on your corporate uh, income tax. If you have a big gap, then you pay pay a higher rate. Um, I had the pleasure of introducing this guy last week, um, Representative Josh Elliott from Connecticut. Uh, he's a co-author of this legislation, and he's also a small businessman. So he spoke very passionately about how you know there's this myth that it's the owners of capital who are the job creators in this country, and in his experience. Um, he understands why having employees who feel valued, who feel part of a team, um, if that's what makes helps him make money with this uh, small business. Um, we don't have enough research on uh, the, the different business tax structures in all the cities across the country, but I thought I'd share what we do have uh, that the Portland government did uh, produce in the course of their um, debate over this. Three other cities in the top 20 in the US have the same kind of local business profits tax that Portland does. And those are New York City, Philadelphia, and Columbia. So some pretty uh, important cities there. But you don't have to have the exact same kind of tax that they have in Portland. Um, five states, for example, have a gross receipts tax. And that's the approach that San Francisco is looking at is uh, increasing the gross receipts tax for companies that have these um, extreme gaps that we do need to do more research on this. Uh, this is the woman who's championing this in the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. One interesting twist there is that um, under their laws, they have to bring tax uh, laws uh, before the people. So they are thinking that this might be on the ballot as early as June 2018. And that seems far off and you know, I'm eager to get more um, more progress going on this faster, but at the same time, I have to admit, this is a really new concept. Not that many people know about it. And so having it on the ballot in San Francisco, I think would really do a lot to raise awareness of it around the country. Uh, I thought it might also be helpful to share a little bit of my thinking on how to respond to some of the common arguments against uh, these taxes. The number one that I always hear is, uh, won't companies just leave to avoid the tax? And uh, again, it's important to remember this doesn't apply just to companies that are headquartered in these tax jurisdictions. It would apply to ones who do, do business there. So I think it's very unlikely they would abandon a lucrative market uh, just because of this uh, small tax. Um, and again, to remember that Whenever we're pushing progressive change that would affect companies, we we hear this argument that you know we'll the company's saying oh we'll just pull out if that passes. And uh, in the living wage fight, uh, those kinds of threats haven't um, have proved pretty empty, and I think they would on this one as well. Another argument I sometimes get is, well, won't the companies um, rig it so that they um, outsource their lowest paid workers to narrow the gap without reducing their um, CEO pay? And again, I did the math on this and it just seems completely uh, impossible. Um, take, for example, a large company that has average CEO pay, which was $12.4 million in 2015. They would have to fire enough workers at the bottom to raise their median worker pay to $124,000 um, in order to get below that 100 to 1 ratio, and that's just not very realistic. Um, okay, now I get to the kind of not so happy part, the, the non-holiday part of this presentation, which is the obstacles. So. Uh, there are forces here in Washington that really want to kill this. Uh, they really want to block the progress at the state and local level. 
And the tactic that they, they have to do this would be to kill the federal um, SEC disclosure regulation that is supposed to be requiring companies to start reporting the gap between their CEO and their worker pay um, starting in, in early 2018. Uh, the Business Roundtable, our friends over there have uh, highlighted this as one of the top things they want to get rid of in terms of regulations. And the Republicans um, are trying to move this uh, Wall Street deregulation bill. It's called the Financial Choice Act. And one provision in this very massive um, piece of legislation is it would kill the, the pay ratio disclosure. Um, that could come up for a House floor vote within weeks. Um, at the SEC, um, there are also um, major haters of this issue, and uh, so they are, are trying to pull uh, tricks to, to drag things out. Finally, what can you do? This is my last slide. This is where I have to try to be really persuasive here. Um, I just uh, really urge people to look into the potential for advocating these kinds of CEO worker pay ratio taxes in your own city or state. Um, if you're unclear about the, the legal you know, structures there, you could ask for a, you know, a legal analysis of that. But the more momentum we get going around the country on this, the more people know about about it, the more people care about it, the, the harder it's going to be for the other side to get rid of um, the, the disclosure rule that would make these kinds of taxes very easy to implement. Um, we've also got to push on Congress and tell members not to get rid of this as part of the Choice Act or any other legislation. And um, as you can probably imagine, we are zealots on this issue at the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, we've set up a whole page on inequality.org with all of the resources, including this website, um, on our campaign page. And we will also do regular updates through our weekly inequality newsletter. So please uh, subscribe to that um, if you would like to stay informed. And I guess I, I have time for a couple of questions, maybe, before we, we are going to move to Teo Reyes from Rock united to talk about the tipped um, minimum wage issue in a second but if there are any questions before we move on i'd be happy to answer those yes um i'm going to give a minute for people to type in questions again go down to the bottom of your zoom and you'll see a q and a box okay i see one question um as i'm waiting for a couple questions i actually have a question for you sarah i'm actually wondering how did the gap between CEO pay and worker pay grow mm -hmm. so much? Because you were showing that chart, and yeah. it's an exponential change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it really took off in the 1990s. A huge uh, reason for that is that they did a, a tax reform that um, encouraged companies to start shoveling out boatloads of stock-based pay, so in the form of stock options and, and stock grants. Um, the reason for that is that uh, they were all fully tax deductible uh, for the company. And so the more they gave their CEO in, in compensation and bonuses, the less companies would pay in taxes. So that's one reason for just the huge explosion of pay starting in the 1990s. But also we just have a system uh, in our country where the uh, corporate boards that make the decisions on CEO pay are often stacked by other CEOs. <laughs> and it's sort of, a, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back kind of system. Nobody wants to question um, this perverse, you know, insane uh, system that we have, which we even in the wake of the financial crisis, where we know that the executive pay and the, the Wall Street bonuses were a factor that encouraged the recklessness that, that drove our economy off a cliff. Um, it's still um, incredibly tough to get companies to acknowledge that, that this is an issue. Thank you, Sarah. So we have a few questions. So I know that you do work that about CEOs is actually cross industry. So this question gets to that. So should financial institution CEO that gap be treated different than any other corporation CEO gap? Um, this participant wonders if that the financial corporations might have a smaller gap. Is that mm. true or not? And to think about that cross section. 
I think the financial crisis showed that the problems with the perverse incentives in our executive pay system are probably more dangerous in the financial sector than anywhere else because they really had the ability to, to blow up the country and, and, and a lot of the world. So it's a, it's a major uh, concern when it comes to the financial sector. When you get to the, the pay gaps, um, you're probably thinking that the gaps would be lower because a lot of people in the financial sector, even if they're not the top brass, um, that they're probably making pretty good pay. But if you look at bank tellers, for example, they make terrible. They are, you know, way down there at the rock bottom level. Um, and so uh, firms like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and all of them, um, I'm pretty sure when the data come out, it's going to show that they have really extreme gaps as well. Thank you. This question is, has the corporate attack on pay ratio disclosure turned any former congressional supporters of the idea into opponents? Turn any, uh, turn any of the, the supporters of the, um, of, the, of the disclosure rule into opponents or not totally sure I, I understand what you mean. I think the biggest challenge really with Congress right now is that people aren't paying attention to this. So this Financial Choice Act, which is the big Dodd-Frank rollback, you know, let's, let's deregulate Wall Street bill, it has so much in it that people don't know that part of it is that it would get rid of the CEO uh, pay ratio disclosure thing. Um, I have started to, to really um, try to reach out to journalists to get them to cover this. And, you know, in a sense, I can understand because there's so many bad things in that, that legislation. It's hard to keep track of them all. But I think CEO pay is something, again, like I said, it, it cuts across the political spectrum that people are fed up with this uh, system. Um, they they want to do something practical to, to crack down on CEO pay. And I think the more people hear that, that this is really under assault, the more they're going to be energized. Um, we did help generate thousands of letters to the SEC about a month ago when they reopened public comment on this. I think the, the, uh, the number in favor was about 20,000 versus, you know, maybe a handful of companies that, that um, are opposed to this disclosure rule. And the supporters include ordinary people who are angry uh, about uh, rising inequality, as well as state treasurers who are responsible for their state's pension funds and know that, that these extreme gaps are are bad uh, for investors as well. So maybe we should move on to Teo, uh, who has yes. been such a champ coming out when he's not feeling um, perfectly well, but but he is a, a crusader for uh, working people in this country, especially restaurant workers. And, and I just want to say how much we value our uh, collaboration with Rock. And kind of as a bridge here, I can say that one way that we have collaborated with Rock a lot is around the issue of CEO pay, because while Rock is a you know a fierce uh, organization that is making good progress to defend um, uh, restaurant workers and lift up their um, uh, working standards, they are up against some formidable forces. Um, namely the CEOs of big restaurant companies, um, the same guys who are pocketing massive uh, paychecks while uh, blocking even the most modest improvements in standards and wages for their own workers. So I think we'll just turn it over to Teo to talk to you about the work they're doing around the country to fight back. Teo. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for having me, uh, Sarah, for inviting me to to be with you on this webinar, uh, you know, we, we really appreciate the work of the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, it's been in, incredibly uh, important to, to advancing the, um, the cause of restaurant workers in particular with this issue of CEO pay that, that, um, that Sarah mentioned. Um, you know, the Andrew Puzder, who was recently put forward as the Labor Secretary nominee, he's, uh, he's one of these spokespeople for the industry who advocates, you know, no minimum wage, uh, automation, um, uh, has spent a lot of energy opposing uh, the ACA uh, and any time of overtime, any type of overtime uh, regulations. And so it was, it was great that we were able to, to stop them, to stop him from becoming the labor secretary, because that's, that would have really put uh, that really would have meant that the Department of Labor would have been in the hands of the National Restaurant Association, uh, which represents these corporate interests of, of, of major restaurant chains around the country. 
Uh, the National Restaurant Association is not uh, a necessarily a household name. We call it the other NRA. The NRA, of course, is extremely well known, but the NRA, both at the other NRA, both at the national level and at the state level and at the local level, has been extremely influential in uh, blocking uh, initiatives for both uh, worker welfare, for, for public health. They were instrumental in, in, in preventing tobacco legislation from becoming implemented in city after city and state after state. They, they delayed that, that process for years, uh, all under the auspice that, the, that any slight change to the industry would mean that it would, uh, that, that it would mean its uh, immediate demise. So their argument is always the chicken little, the sky's always falling. Any type of change, any type of regulation is going to decimate industry, to decimate the, the restaurant industry, and yet it continues to, to grow every year. Um, so perhaps some of you are familiar with their efforts to prevent paid sick days legislation. They always are in the forefront of that battle. And something you may not be as familiar with, they're in the forefront of preventing trans fat regulation, which is a huge public health issue. Uh, there was recently a study in, in New York that looked at different counties where trans fats were banned from, from uh, restaurants versus uh, counties where they were not. And you could see an immediate uh, health impact on myocardial infarctions and, and strokes. So, so these are huge public health issues that, that impact millions of Americans. Um, also, sodium regulations, uh, menu calorie, um, uh, uh, calorie counts on menus, all these things are issues that that the Restaurant Association has really paused or, or tried to push back or sued to prevent from implementation. Um, and the issue that we have worked on uh, most, uh, that we've devoted most of our energy to um, right now is something we call one fair wage. And so the, the Restaurant Association um, has been the strongest opponent of increases to the minimum wage. And along with that, increases to the tipped minimum wage. And I'll just quick share this little uh, slideshow. So this, uh, I don't have a slideshow, but I do have a slide. Um, let's see. Is it, is it sh I believe it's showing. Um, and so this shows the subminimum wage uh, around the country. And since 19 1990 was the last time that the uh, subminimum wage was increased for tipped workers at the federal level. And that's when it, when it uh, went up to $2.13. After that, the next time there was a minimum wage increase, which was in 1996, uh, the Restaurant Association, which was then headed by Herman Cain, negotiated with Congress, said, okay, we won't oppose an increase to the minimum wage, but you have to keep the subminimum wage frozen at 2.13. So for the last um, 27 years, uh, it has been frozen at that level at 2.13. Uh, but as you can see, there is there's a variation around the country. Not not every so there's a, there's 18, 19 states that, that right now follow that 213 minimum wage. Uh, there's several additional states that are under three dollars, um, and a, a handful more that are under four dollars. So these are all very low wages for for uh, hourly wages for for workers. There's also seven states that have not had a sub minimum wage uh, for decades now. Uh, and one state that just recently adopted a one fair wage system, what we call a one fair wage system, which is one of both rising wages and uh, no sub minimum wage for, for tipped workers. And so this allows, uh, uh, you know, allows us to compare how, how does the industry fare, how do workers fare in these different locations where you have both where you don't have a sub minimum wage uh, and where you do. And one thing, the uh, things that we have found, for example, is that the industry is uh, grows faster, uh, um, uh, that there's greater rates of, of employment growth. Now, these are all my marginal differences. These aren't like huge, spectacular differences, but there is, the, but the positive, but the difference is a positive one. So anything, any argument that the industry makes about how raising the wage is going to automatically lead to decline uh is proven that it is is shown to be false because you have these seven states california nevada um washington oregon montana minnesota alaska and now maine that do not have a, a sub minimum wage system and where the industry is doing great right you don't you don't hear about the restaurant industry suffering in in any in, in any of these locations and, and in fact they are not uh but we also find that poverty rates are lower uh, in general, around around the country, uh, the poverty rates for tipped workers are twice, uh, about one and a half times to twice twice the poverty rate of the general workforce. 
And, um, and this is important because tipped workers are uh, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly women. Between 66% and 70% of tipped workers are women um, around the country. Uh, it, it's 66% of all tipped workers and closer to 70% of tipped restaurant workers that are, that are women. So here you have a situation where you have a, a workforce uh, that by law is, um, uh, receives a lower wage and it's primarily uh, um, and is a workforce dominated by women, uh, and so this is this also contributes um, to to the gender uh, pay equity gap that we see around the around the country. Um, on top of that, we find that in locations where uh, wages are higher, such as in fine dining establishments, uh, these tipped occupations are much more likely to be dominated by by men and, and white men in particular. <clears throat> so we find that women that are the majority of the industry are relegated to the lowest earning opportunities within the industry and have earned the lowest wages. Uh, and so one of the things that we've been able to, to find, uh, again, comparing, uh, excuse me, <coughs> comparing uh, these seven states to the rest of the country, is that we found that sexual harassment rates are much higher in the 213 states. And if you think about it, it makes sense because um, if you're a worker and your, your income does not come from your check, from your employer, because I, these workers who earn 213, <coughs> these workers who earn 213, um, they get a check that says this is not a check and it gets zeroed out because all their all their wage income goes to their taxes So in order to to pay their bills, they have to receive tips from their customers this means that if a customer acts inappropriately <coughs> They're not likely to Excuse me, they're not likely to um, To challenge them or say hey that behavior is inappropriate because they don't want to lose their income. They don't want to lose their wage so we found that the highest rates of sexual harassment in the country are among women who are tipped workers in 213 states, uh, but that in fact, this higher rate of sexual harassment affects all workers. Um, it changes the entire climate such that sexual harassment increases for all workers in those establishments. So for back end house workers and also for, um, for men as well, although the, again, the highest rates of sexual harassment are experienced by women. Um, the, um, and so, uh, uh, tied to that, we find that employers also demand that in these 213 states are much more likely to demand that their workers dress up sexier to go to work so that they can get tips so that they don't have any, any liability to try to make up their minimum wage at the end of the day. So it's a vicious, it's a vicious cycle, uh, that has a negative impact on not just workers in the restaurant industry, but really on everybody. The restaurant industry is uh, one of the first, um, is one of the, it, it employs about 10% of the workforce, but it's also one of the first points of entry for most workers. I believe half of the uh, workforce in the US at some point or another works in the restaurant industry. Uh, and so <clears throat> what you learn <clears throat> at your job <clears throat> I'm really sorry. What you learn at your job uh, is uh, how you expect to be treated, uh, and then this is something that you take with you to other work, as, to other jobs as well. And so for us, this is uh, this is an economic issue. It's a moral issue, uh, and it simply does not have to be that way. We we know that there's again multiple states that do not have that. So we've been instituting one fair wage campaigns around the country. We recently were able to get uh, to get it on the ballot in Maine, and it was passed by a majority of voters. And um, uh, we are currently engaged in legislative fights in D.C. Uh, not in legislative, I mean in ballot initiative fights in D.C. Uh, we are looking at instituting a, a ballot campaign in Michigan, and we are currently engaged in uh, minimum wage campaigns, legislative campaigns in Massachusetts and in New York and are looking to expand that to other states as well. Um, 
uh, to, in order to overcome uh, the power of the restaurant association to raise wages uh, overall. It's, it's extremely difficult. Um, again, the restaurant association has uh, very an open door. Uh, it's something that's very extremely difficult for us to do through the legislature. Uh, the most likely path to success is through a ballot initiative. Uh, but then we need to be able to defend um, defend these bills after the fact. So right now we're in a position in Maine where there's been a tremendous campaign orchestrated by the Restaurant Association where they've instilled a massive amount of fear in workers that they will all lose their tips with the, uh, with the increase to the wage. And so that they've uh, convinced the legislature to try to revoke the, the will of the people in that, in that ballot initiative. So this is an ongoing fight for us. And this is something that we would like all of you to... Um, uh, to join us with, um, we've seen victories also in certain states, like in, in, in certain cities, like in Flagstaff, Arizona, which become, became a one fair wage city this past, um, this past fall as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there and, and take questions. Uh, but you know, we're definitely looking for ways uh, to expand the footprint of one fair wage around the country. Uh, we think this is both winnable and it's also something that is, um, necessary for, any progressive movement uh, that wants to really um, undermine the base of the of 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 the of you know the Trump administration. Many of the people that voted for Trump were were servers and bartenders who felt that they were you know that their future that they didn't have uh, much of a future. And so you know we think this is really important to the, the, that we, we go out there and be mobilizing workers, uh, bringing them in, into a a. A uh, progressive legislative campaign uh, that gives them a voice um, and, uh, and and ensures progress for the country. All right, thank you, Teo. We appreciate the presentation. Uh, I learned a lot, actually, even though I do know a lot of people who are tip workers. My mother's tip worker. My husband was a tip worker when we first met. So I definitely understand. And that's the industry that most college students and people my age are in right now to they graduate. So um, Teo, I really want to honor your resiliency, but also respect your health. So <laughs> I'm going to give you, yes, I'm going to give you one or two questions. And then we are going to go into the poll, our last poll about action steps of all our participants. And then I'm going to go into the Q&A for both you and Sarah. So you can take a moment to get some water and all of that. So we had a really good question from someone who is a student activist, and they were wondering how they can push the one fair wage agenda on their college campuses. Um, I think that's uh, that's a great uh, that's a great question. I think we, we definitely need to see uh, greater activism from uh, students and on campuses. Like you said, most uh, many students are in the restaurant industry. Um, and a lot of them, if it's their first job, they don't really have a, a you know, point of perspective to say, boy, this is really, this behavior is really unacceptable. Um, and so I think, oh, I'm sorry, there's a fire drill happening in my building. Um, uh, so we would, we would love to, we would love to see um, uh, campus uh, student groups uh, join Rock in support of of these one fair wage campaigns uh, to help us reach out to to their uh, fellow students who are um, uh, restaurant workers as well uh, and and just help us to combat some of the negative um, some of the ne negative information. So I mean, you know, I think if if they were really interested, if they were interested in that, we would love to talk about how to build help build, uh, you know, support committees on campuses for, for one fair wage. I mean, potentially one thing we could do is, um, I mean, I, I don't think there's a lot of tipped workers on campuses themselves, but if there were, that could be a situation we could have, where we could have the university require that workers be paid, um, you know, a certain, uh, a certain minimum wage. Um, I, I think there's, there's multiple strategies we could, we could think about. Thank you for a thorough answer. I also think about um, on college campuses, you have a lot of the same restaurant industries like Carl's Jr., um, Wendy's are actually on the campus and you have these tip workers working there who aren't even going to the school. They don't have that privilege of being able to have that educational access, but they're going through these same things, having that sub minimum wage while serving college students who will probably end up having the same fate after they graduate. So thank you, Teo. Please go get some water. We're going to go into our <laughs> last poll. Um, this get last, away from the fire. Yes, get, get away from the fire. Get water for your throat <laughs> and for the fire outside. 
uh, here's our last poll. We really want to know what you are planning to do to push these campaigns forward. Where are you going to do this? Are you going to do this at the city or local level? Are you planning to do this at the state level? At the federal or national level? Within a particular industry sector in a certain business such as Walmart? Are you interested in certain types of corporations? And of course, this is multiple choice. So if you're planning to hit this at different angles, click as many as apply. And again, we understand that we have people here who represent organizations, so this might be an organized campaign, but we also have individuals who are gonna do really important things like calling their Congress members, signing petitions, and getting the word out to their friends and family and kind of dispelling these myths, even if it's at the dinner table, right? Because even that work needs to be done. So we're gonna give you a few seconds to answer the poll. There's no wrong answer here. <laughs> <laughs> and if you were like, well, I wasn't planning to do anything, well, then I guess it's time to figure out what you are going to commit to. <laughs> All right, we're going to have five more seconds. All right, Mimi, if you would please close the poll. Let's see our results. Okay, we have 50% of people said that they're going to work at the city or local level. So we have city, we have right. campuses, we have counties, and then we have 67% at the state level. So that's really cool. We have people, half of the people are going at the city and two thirds are gonna go above that and go city and state. We have 42% at the federal or national level. So just a little bit below half. I can understand that. It can be difficult sometimes with those federal fights. I'm definitely about reorienting ourselves back to state and local power. And then we have 0% within a particular industry sector, a certain business. And I'm sure that's because we are thinking um, pretty intersectionally cross industry and we're really going to think about what level it's going to be and hit a lot of industries and hit a lot of industries. So Mimi, you can close the poll for us. Thank you. So Teo, are we ready? All right, looking good. Your house isn't burning down, it looks like. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna start with a question for Sarah. And this also might be a question for you, Teo. One of our participants asked, where can we find effective inequality messaging to the public support for the tax campaigns, also for the one fair wage campaigns? This particular participant would like our residents to connect the dots via TV and other types of media. So. Where can we find effective inequality messaging for these two campaigns? Sarah? Mm -hmm. the, the first thing that came to my mind is actually something that uh, Rock and the One Fair Wage campaign do really well, I think, which is lifting up stories of real people who've been affected. Um, Teo spoke earlier about the campaign to block Andrew Pudster uh, from being labor secretary. And one thing they did was they helped get some of his own workers here to Washington to tell their own stories. And I tell you, there was hardly a dry eye in the room on Capitol Hill when that was happening. So I think those are the most powerful um, uh, ways to communicate is, is through stories. Um, uh, but you know, here at the Institute for Policy Studies, we're we're taking this question really uh, seriously, and don't pretend to have all the answers about the best way to to message about inequality, especially going beyond sort of our normal circles. We have an op-ed service that goes to a lot of uh, rural uh, and non-urban red areas where we try to uh, present progressive um, positions, including on taxes and inequality, in a way that that we. We think um, might resonate with people who we, we know, um, you know, however they voted, the polling shows that um, people are with us when it comes to CEO pay, when it comes to uh, reigning in the power of Wall Street and things like that. But but we're, we're in a learning process. I, I would encourage people to go to inequality.org where we have a lot of materials, also a lot of uh, facts and figures that can be combined with the kind of stories that, that Rock and, and others are collecting. We also, once a week, feature what we call an inequality face on the front lines. Uh, someone uh, around the country who's doing something bold and innovative to, to take on inequality. And, and we find a lot of inspiration in those stories as well. Uh, yeah, certainly storytelling is, is, is um, you know, gathering stories is, is crucial, having, having people share their, their experiences. Uh, there's just so much um, ignorance on the issue too. Um, that that's sort of the first step, I think, is trying to, to, to get people to even be aware. Both of these issues, I think, 
uh, CEO pay or the issue of the summer wage. I think most people are not aware uh, that these are these are major problems. Um, um, and then, you know, when you when you do try to present it, you have uh, you get these very uh, extreme responses from uh, the from um, uh, you know the, it's it's all, the, the response is always the, they seem to be very extreme, right? And anything that you're, you're advocating is going to mean that the industry is going to collapse, and, right. and it's it's um, and so you you need to um, uh, I, I, we still have to figure out how to crack that so that people are able to just laugh at that as 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 silly because it is right. Every every all these initiatives that people are pushing they they, they don't lead to um, the destruction of, of of the business community. Um, and so I think that's something that we need to figure out how to get that message out still. Um, but that's something that we're trying to do. One of the campaigns that we're working on is this issue of trying to toxify the National Restaurant Association so that legislators don't feel comfortable taking money from them, right? And don't feel comfortable uh, being publicly associated with them. The Restaurant Association was, the, was uh, you know, has been sending out letters in support of the ACA repeal and has been one of the one of a very big advocate of this. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's been very, that, that's something we're still trying to get, figure out is the right messaging to educate people on this. Uh, and so it, it definitely, if anyone has ideas, we'd love to hear it. Uh, but we all do have information also on our, on our onefairwage.com site um, as well. Read it to me. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Teo. So we, I'm actually going to do our last question and then we'll go into closing remarks and our conclusion. Mm -hmm. So our last question is, is do the presenters see any conflict, any at all, between pushing the CEO reduction campaign versus building the movement for worker owned and controlled companies and pushing for a one fair wage to eventually abolishing the leech CEO system of profit over people? Hmm. Great question. I, personally, I don't see a conflict. Uh, we're all for uh, more worker-owned uh, models at, as a way to build the power of workers and have more equitable uh, you know, district reward systems within uh, companies and, and, and organizations. So um, I think that we can move on these different tracks in uh, criticizing the current compensation model of the, the big um, private uh, companies while uh, lifting up these uh, alternative models. Um, Teo, I don't know if you have a <laughs> response to that. Um, so we've actually been working also to to organize employers. Um, we have a, a network called RAISE. Uh, the, the name was, was put together by restaurant owners themselves, uh, Restaurants Advancing Industry Standards and Employment. Um, and so we're trying to essentially divide the opposition uh, you know, we're, we're, there's there's a lot of restaurant owners who hold our our values um, and who we want to be able to work with and ensure that they're successful as well. So there's not necessarily a conflict. Some of the raised members that we work with are worker cooperatives as well. Uh, and one of the, the the one of the tools that we're trying to uh, propagate through the raised network is what's called um, open book management, so that uh, workers are fully aware of of how uh, profits are allocated and how, uh, you know, how they can best contribute to the, to the industry. So it's, I don't think it's an either or proposition, uh, uh, you know, but certainly any, anything that helps to promote um, worker power and involvement is, 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 is uh, you know, is a good, and, and we, we, we consciously work with employers to try to promote that. All right, thank you. I wanna thank Teo and Sarah for all their work building broad-based coalitions, for pushing legislation and being a part of this fight. I also wanna thank all of our attendees for joining us today and staying committed to fighting inequality. If you would like more information on Rock's campaign and raising the subminimum wage and getting one fair wage, please check out rockunited.org or onefairwage.com, and the one is actually spelled out on that. And if you would like to keep up on everything related to inequality and how we can fight inequality, please sign up for our weekly newsletter at inequality.org. It has great writers, great columns, and I love the phrases on the front lines that Sarah mentioned earlier. Also, we will be sending out a post-webinar survey please fill it out. It will help us do events even better. Let us know what we're doing well. And also give us a snapshot of the demographics of the event other than sort of the regional and the action steps snapshots that we took today. 
So thank you very much. And also, if you have any pressing suggestions or questions about today's webinar, please send us an email at info at IPS slash DC.org. And we hope to see you soon. And we hope to see you sharing this webinar on social media. Again, hashtag one fair wage. That's the number one fair wage and hashtag CEO pay. Thank you. Thank you.